You can come on up, Lydia, and the rest of the children as well. Okay, I need to borrow someone's cell phone. Who has a cell phone with them? Kim has one, good. I promise not to call China. <laughs> if it rings, I'll answer it. Is that... Good morning. Good morning. Good. <laughs> so, have any of you ever seen something that looks like this? Yeah. yeah, everybody's seen a cell phone today, although this is kind of a nice one. Let me see what games we have on. No. What do we use a telephone for? Other than to play games, your mom and dad probably has a cell phone or a telephone in your house. What do you use them for? We use them to call people. Use them to call people and talk to people, right? Sure. Where are you going there, bud? <laughs> yeah, well, he's going to play drums. Why should that not surprise me? <laughs> so you use a telephone to call people and talk to people. Now, did you ever hear somebody using a phone and talking to somebody else, and you only hear one side of it? <laughs> <laughs> he must be a relative. <laughs> When you only hear one side of the conversation, it's, you can't necessarily understand what's going on. Because someone will say, oh, hello, Mom, how you doing? Uh, apples. Uh, no, on Tuesday. And you're saying to yourself, apples? No, on Tuesday? What's that all about? <laughs> and so that's how it is sometimes when we talk to God. Can I have those, please? Here, I'll hold them. Thank you. Going to have the other one? Thank you. So when we only hear one side of the conversation, it's a little bit like that. We don't necessarily understand what's going on. How about when we pray? What happens then? Oh, now we're going to try the microphone. <laughs> I think I've lost this one today, you know? So when someone is praying... Is someone listening? <laughs> it's been a while since I've had you for a children's story sermon. <laughs> had better choice. So when we have a telephone and we're talking to someone, and when we're praying and talking to God, do we listen as well as we talk? When you're on the phone and you're talking to someone, we are always dependent upon somebody else talking back to us. And when we pray to God, we are dependent upon him speaking back to us as well. So let's pray together. Paul Michael, can we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you this day for the children and the blessings that they are and the lessons we learn with them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing us and answering our prayer. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Here, take this back to your mom. No, I better do that myself. She may need this to call help. <laughs> so last Sunday... The children were in church at Huron United Methodist, where they worship regularly. And Paul Michael goes up front, and the pastor's doing a children's story sermon. And Paul Michael says, you know what? And the pastor says, what? And Paul Michael, blah, 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 blah. At which point Lydia translates. And so he says, oh, okay. And so he gets started back into his children's story sermon. And Paul Michael goes, you know what? And the pastor says, what? Blah, 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 blah. And Lydia translates. Three times that happened. So I felt pretty good. I got away easy this morning, I think, here. W.C. Field says, never go on stage with children or animals. 
because <laughs> you are not in control when that, is the, when that is the situation at all. If you have your Bible with you today, I'd encourage you to read the Word as we read God's Word together. We have two passages of Scripture we're going to look at, Luke chapter 24 and then 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading the Gospel passage first, Luke chapter 24, and begin our reading with verses 13 and reading through verse 35, a familiar passage of Scripture of Jesus and the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24 and beginning with verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in, there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our own rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So they went in, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to, to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us while on the road and opened the scriptures to up? us. Then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two of them told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And then turning to first Peter chapter one and reading there verses 17 through 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, and beginning with verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living way and enduring word of God. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 tells us, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. 
When God created the world and all that was in it, and he had created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, things were perfect. Adam and Eve were created without sin or without blemish, without spots. But there was the opportunity for sin to occur. God had instructed them to not eat of a certain tree in the middle of the garden. They were to be obedient to God, and had they remained obedient to God, they would have remained perfect and been in the garden. But God knew that they were going to sin. Now, I need you to understand a couple of things. God is not the author of sin. Sin is a choice that you and I make to be disobedient to God, and that's the nature of sin, is disobedience. Adam and Eve had plenty of other things from which to eat in that garden, but when the serpent beguiled them and they ate of the tree, they sinned against God by being disobedient. And in sinning, their eyes were opened and they saw their sin and they saw their own nakedness and they became ashamed of it. And when God saw that they had sinned and had hidden in that garden, hiding themselves from him, he asked them about that sin. And because of the sin, blood needed to be shed for the cleansing of their sin. God took the skins and of animals and provided garments for them, provided clothing for them. He put them outside of the garden as a bit of protection for them to keep them from eating of the tree of life. He did not want them to eat of the tree of life in their sinful condition and be forever condemned by their sin. Now, sin is condemning to us. And if there is no propitiation made for our sin, if there is no sacrifice made for our sin, if we live in a state of sinfulness and we die in a state of sinfulness, then the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed in vain for us. And from that time of the garden until the time of Jesus, the sacrifice of an animal was necessary for the blood of that animal to provide a covering for mankind's sin. It began long, long, long time ago. And it continued on when Abraham took his son Isaac up onto Mount Moriah and took him to the place that God had instructed him. It was there that he was willing to take the life of his son, his only son, and God stopped his hand in the midst and showed him instead a ram that was caught in the thicket by its horns. Now think about that for a moment. How many times do you think rams get caught in thickets by their by thorns? You know anything about rams and how strong their necks must be to be able to have those horns and to butt against one another? You think they're going to get caught in a thicket by thorns? God prepared that ram to be there just at that moment to provide that its blood would be the covering for the sin. And then worship took place. And worship was always surrounding the blood always dealing with the blood. Blood becomes an important issue for us. Now, some of us don't like blood. I don't mind seeing blood as long as it's not mine. Mine, I, it, it doesn't make me queasy. It just makes me uncomfortable realizing that something is amiss. I have cut myself. I have, you know, done something to myself. That's how it happens most of the time for me. It's not when I'm submitting myself for surgery. I understand those kinds of things. But if I cut my hand or I cut my finger or even, you know, the nastiest thing, a paper cut. Don't you just hate it when that happens? And you see your own blood. What's the first thing that all of us want to do when we cut our... Yeah. Put it in our mouth. Why do we do that? Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I don't have the answer for that one today. But we don't like it. But blood is necessary. Now, Sarah had to answer a question recently from her daughter, Lydia, who said to her, Mommy, how comes my veins look blue and my blood is red? Tell that one to a five or four-year-old. 
Yeah, we have lots of questions about blood. There's a lot of things about blood that we understand and a few things about blood that we don't have any clue. At least most of us don't have any clue. Like how can someone's type be A and someone's type be B and someone's type be O and someone's type be AB and some of us be negative and some of us be positive and yeah. all looks the same. The scripture says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Sin causes death. The Apostle Paul instructs us with that in, in the book of Romans. The wages of sin is death. And the shedding of blood is that which takes the life from that animal. And so for thousands of years, Israel worshipped daily by sacrificing a lamb. When the temple took place, and even before that, when it was the tabernacle, a lamb was sacrificed. A perfect lamb, one without blemish, one without spot. It was sacrificed. Its blood was taken and sprinkled in that temple or in that tabernacle in such a way to provide the covering for sin. Now, most of us think that would be very unusual, and I'm glad we don't do that today. I wouldn't like that. And most of us would be pretty uncomfortable with that. But sin causes death. And the death of that animal provides that blood, and the blood it provides the covering for that sin. But now has come Jesus. Remember when Jesus came? Remember about two months ago or so when we, uh, maybe it's a little longer than that, it was the end of January, however long a period of time that was, I preached a sermon to you, that dealt with the topic of behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When John the Baptist was down there in the Jordan River baptizing people, he was baptizing them for the forgiveness of sin, and along comes Jesus, and he looks at him and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What do you mean the Lamb of God? The Lamb of God has been until this time an animal. It has been a lamb. It has been a lamb without blemish or spot that was sacrificed. And its blood sprinkled on the altar and sprinkled on the people for the covering of their sins. In the high priest days, when someone was to be made a high priest, now think about this, don't think too long about it, but think about this. When someone was to be made the high priest, they were put down in a subterranean room, a room underneath the building. And this building had wooden floors that had many holes drilled in those wooden floors. And up on that floor, the, a high priest was down underneath there. Now you got that picture. And up on that floor, a bull would be sacrificed. And its blood completely drained on that floor. The bull was the sin offering, and its blood would be completely poured out on that floor, and the high priest would stand underneath there with the holes allowing that blood to run through and drip through, and he would be completely covered in the blood of that sin offering. That was his initiation into being high priest. He was covered in the blood. He would even open his mouth and allow it to drip onto his tongue. He would allow it to come onto his face. Every part of his body was covered with the blood of that bull that was sacrificed. And then he would come out and present himself to the people. The high priest, the one who was covered in the blood. When Jesus comes, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He becomes our Savior at the moment of sacrifice. At the moment when He is nailed to the cross, at the moment when His blood is shed, and His blood has been shed as the whole part of this journey. When His blood has been shed, His back has been given those to those with the whip and the cat of nine tails who have 
lacerated him over and over again. They have placed the crown of thorns upon his head. The, the blood has spurted out from his head. When they have crucified him and nailed him to the cross through his hands and his feet, the blood was shed for the covering of our sins, but not just for the for covering, but for forgiveness. You see, the problem with an animal sacrifice is that it had to be done regularly, daily at one point in time in Israel's history. In fact, in, in, in the high days of the temple, at least two lambs were sacrificed every day in the temple. Over and over and over again, the lambs were sacrificed and the blood was shed until the perfect lamb comes. The lamb of God who doesn't cover the sin of the world. What does John say? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We sang that hymn, What Can Wash Away My Sin? And the answer is, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We don't sing the hymn, what can cover my sin? What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so when Peter is telling us here about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his blood being given for the remission of our sins and his blood being sacrificed for us, and his life being given for us, we need to realize the serious and important nature of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is not just a crucifixion. Jesus is not the only man ever to have been crucified. The Romans were good at crucifixion. They had crucified thousands of people. In fact, there is recorded in Josephus' history that on one day a thousand people were crucified in Jerusalem. A thousand in one day. The world has seen crucifixion before. But they have not seen a Savior until Jesus. And when Jesus' blood was shed on the cross, it becomes the substitutionary atonement for you and me. You and I deserve to die. But Jesus takes our place. Many, many years ago, early in my ministry, I was asked to make a pastoral visit to someone who was being detained in a prison on a murder charge. This was the old Schuylkill County prison. At that time, it was the oldest still standing, still used prison in the United States. The court mandated it finally be destroyed and a new one built, and there is today a new prison in Schuylkill County, but this was the old prison. So I went to see this guy, and I'm young and bold and brash. Now I'm just old and bold and brash. I was young and bold and brash, and I went to see this guy, and, you know, I'd never been in a prison before. I wasn't sure what the protocol was. I went dressed in, you know, something that probably looked like this, and I went inside, and they made me take off my tie, they made me take off my jacket, they made me take off my belt, all of those kinds of things. I had to completely empty my pockets of everything that was in them. Had to take my shoelaces out of my shoes. Now, today I don't have shoelaces. I'm an old man today. You see, it's easier with slip-ons than it is with lace-ups. And they escort me out into the visitation area, which was in the middle of this prison, with lots of people milling about. By the way, back in the day in Schuylkill County Prison, all of the inmates and detainees wore street clothes. And so I quickly realized that they didn't look a whole lot different than me. And I did have the fleeting thought for a moment, what if something happens here, how do I identify myself? They dress just like me. I don't have any identification on me. I have nothing to help them understand that I am there as a visitor and not there being detained for something. 
But I got past that. So I go see this young man who is being detained on a prison, on, on a murder charge in this prison. And he is like the caged animal. He is just pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. I'm trying to have a conversation with him and I'm walking back and forth trying to have this conversation with him. And of course, you know what he says. I'm not guilty. I am not guilty. I am not guilty. He repeated that over and over and over again. So I promptly told him he deserved to die. I'm not sure that's the smartest thing to say to someone being held on a murder charge in a prison when you're walking alongside them and you don't, you know, you look just like everybody else does. But it stopped him in his tracks. He looked at me and said, I didn't do it. Oh, I said, oh, I'm not talking about the current situation that you find yourself in. I don't know whether you're guilty or not guilty of this. The court will determine that. But I want to tell you, you deserve to die. And I want to tell you and me that we deserve to die. Because we have sinned against God. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. But Jesus Christ has come to be our Savior, to be our sacrifice, to be our substitute, the one who takes our place. I talk to the children about prayer, where I'll try to do. And I use the imagery of the telephone. Now I want you to think with me about this for a moment. Imagine it's Thursday. You're almost at the end of your work week. You've come home Thursday evening and you're tired and you just want to sit down and watch the Phillies win. I mean, it's all about prayer, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> come on. And you sit down and you've finished your supper and the dishes have all been put in the dishwasher and all those kinds of things. The pots and pans have all been scrubbed and you put back the recliner and you prop your feet up for a few moments to give yourself a little preview of what your night will be like. You know, when you get to my age, you preview sleep. <laughs> on the recliner. You practice it a little before you, you know. Yeah, yeah, you understand, Randy, trust me. Trust me, I know you do. And the phone rings. And you answer the phone. And it's a voice that you kind of recognize, but you're not really sure. You look at caller ID, and it, and it doesn't tell you anything. And you answer the phone kind of in your sleepy stupor that you've been in, and you hear this recognizable voice, and the guy identifies himself and says, I am Governor Corbett. And he says, I understand that you're a Christian. And you say, uh, yes, I am. And he says, you know, Pennsylvania does have the death penalty law. We haven't practiced it for a while, but we're about to reinstitute the death penalty. And there is a young man who has been convicted of a, a heinous crime, and he is to be put to death tonight in the gas chamber. And as you can imagine, many people have been protesting the fact that Pennsylvania is going to reinstitute the death penalty. And so we decided that we would go to our computers and we would pick out the name of a Christian. And you happen to be the name we picked. 
and we're calling to find out whether you would be willing to take this young man's place. And you would be willing to go into the gas chamber so that the young man might live. What would you say? Every one of us would say, no way. No way am I going to give my life for some young man who has been guilty, found guilty in the court of law for some heinous crime that deserves death, you know, murder, or whatever it happens to be. No way am I going to give my life for someone who deserves to die. That's exactly what Jesus does. God the Father has placed that call to His Son. And His Son says, I'll die for it. I'll die for her. I'll die for him. I'll die for her. I'll die for this one and for that one and for everyone. And his blood was shed. And his life was taken. And forgiveness and redemption happened through Jesus Christ. There is power in the blood. And it's the power of life. And it's the power of forgiveness. And it's the power of redemption. Because Jesus willingly has laid his life down. Jesus says that, doesn't he? No one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. And he's crucified for you and me. And everyone whom we meet. Then the question becomes, does Jesus die in vain? For those who have not yet heard, or who do not yet believe. That's why the gospel ministry is as vital today, as important today, as it has ever been. Because Jesus died for every one of us. If we believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How can they believe if they've not yet heard? And how can they hear if we do not proclaim? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the blood of Jesus. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus' blood has been shed on the cross once for all. Not a repeating sacrifice as was the case in the Old Testament past, but once and for all. For he is the perfect Lamb of God who gives his life 
for our redemption. Lord, strengthen us and encourage us today that we might live our lives to share the good news of Jesus with others. We pray in his name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we still go into a world that rests in darkness because they have not been enlightened by the good news of Jesus Christ. Give us the courage and the conviction to share our faith with our family, our friends, our neighbors, that they might see Jesus and believe in him. Amen.